Beer and baseball, baseball and beer. The two things seem like natural companions and inextricably bound. So why is that? In this video, I want to look at the history of beer, its association with the ballpark, and beer's well-known companion, the hot dog. One thing we can say is that without large-scale German immigration, things might be different. Perhaps meat pies and English ales would have become standard ballpark fare. It was German brewers who introduced lager beer to North America just as its people had begun playing a new bat and ball game. Germans also introduced their ideas about leisure and taught Americans to enjoy Frankfurter sausages. All right, let's talk about beer's history at the ballpark. Beer is an ancient drink revered by the world's earliest civilizations in the Fertile Crescent and Nile River Valley. Made from barley and wheat, every social class and age group consumed the beverage from sun up to sun down, from mighty pharaohs to humble farmers. The oldest piece of world literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh, explicitly associates beer with civilization. To be civilized and settled was to eat bread and drink beer. Workers who built the pyramids, the Egyptian pyramids, were literally paid in beer, and like their neighbors in Mesopotamia, Egyptians consumed a cloudy, viscous version of the beverage from straws. Written sources are filled with references to beer's central place in Egyptian funeral rites and medicinal concoctions. In contrast, Greeks and Romans did not have such a high view of malted beverages. They associated civilization with wine, not beer, and disdained people who did not drink wine. Roman historian Tacitus wrote of unconquered Germanic tribes, quote, to drink, the Teutons have a horrible brew fermented from barley or wheat, a brew which has only a far removed similarity to wine, unquote. In Greco-Roman civilization, only barbarian peoples lacking cities and complex political institutions would ever prefer beer. But cervicia, the Latin word for beer, was widely consumed across the vast empire. Emperor Diocletian, facing inflationary pressures, fixed beer prices in 301 AD. Then beer-drinking barbarians overran the Roman Empire and established their own kingdoms. For centuries, Northern Europeans consumed massive quantities of beer. People needed liquid calories, and they needed assurance of not getting sick from the water during an era when it was likely to contain harmful microorganisms. It was the monasteries which greatly advanced the art of brewing in the Middle Ages because they brewed on a commercial scale, improved the technology of brewing, and gradually made their beer with hops, a cone-shaped flower that turned out to impart not just flavor, but also antibacterial qualities that increased hop beer's shelf life. By the 14th century, commercial breweries in Hamburg were churning out massive quantities of hopped beer for export across Northern Europe's allied ports in the Hanseatic League. In this way, German brewers taught their neighbors to appreciate the aromas and bitterness of hop beer. Three centuries later, major changes were afoot on the British Isles. Brewers had begun using hydrometers and thermometers to gain greater precision over their craft. Brewers also developed a new type of roasted malt for dark beers, porters and stouts. And London brewer Samuel Whitbread applied James Watt's new steam engine to pump beer to and from large vats and produce heretofore unthinkable quantities of ale in the late 18th century. Such technology made a handful of producers such as Whitbread and Arthur Guinness rich and influential. Not long after, English brewers developed another style, India Pale Ale, for shipment to faraway ports across the British Empire. These flavorful stouts and pails inevitably wound up in Britain's former colony, the United States, during the mid-19th century. Something big had happened in continental Europe. Bavarian brewers had developed a yeast, Saccharomyces pastorianus, that fermented beer at cold temperatures and required longer storage. These beers, from the German word lagern, to store, had to be fermented for longer periods of time in chilly caves and underground cellars. But it was worth the wait. Lager had a crisp, refreshing taste, and word spread across Central Europe. 
The city of Pilsen in modern-day Czechia recruited one such Bavarian brewmaster, Joseph Grohl, to work his magic in their city. In 1842, Grohl brought lager yeast to Pilsen and used it to brew with the region's distinctive water, pale malt, and Saz hops. The result pleased everyone. Pilsner beer was light, golden, and had a snow-white foam. Since then, it has become the model for over 90% of the commercial beers produced worldwide, including Tsingtao, Corona Budweiser, and Heineken. Meanwhile, millions of Germans were on the move. For political and economic reasons, they migrated in the millions to the United States, as well as countries elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere, such as Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. Everywhere the Germans went, their lager yeast went too. Even before the American Civil War, cities such as New York, Cincinnati, Milwaukee, and St. Louis had sizable Klein Deutschlands, or Little Germanys, where you could find more than a few lager breweries. Anton Schwartz, a German immigrant to the United States, edited the American Brewer, the country's first trade journal for brewers, and initially published in the German language. Schwartz was an advocate for drier, lighter, less hazy lager, and he championed brewing with adjunct grains such as corn or rice to balance the high protein content of American six row barley malt. The result was American lager, a beer style that is light, dry, mildly hopped, and it was just what Americans wanted, a clear, golden, thirst-quenching brew for hot summer days. All of this brewing innovation dovetailed with the new bat and ball game called baseball, which was sweeping across the Republic. The German immigrant entrepreneurs such as Joseph Schlitz, Frederick Pabst, and Adolphus Busch created highly successful beer empires by embracing the new science of brewing and the possibilities born of industrialization. They also brought ideas about leisure from Germany to the United States. But let's go back to baseball for a minute. The first professional league in the United States, the National Association, unsettled some observers due to its lack of organization and ongoing instability. Teams folded and failed to show up for matches, gamblers paid players to throw games, and the religiously minded disapproved of Sunday baseball games as well as rowdy fans fights and whiskey-fueled mayhem. Also brewing in the country was the American temperance movement, which aimed to prohibit alcohol nationwide due to its direct relationship to impoverished families, domestic violence, and criminal behavior. William Hulbert assumed a moral position when he founded the National League in 1876. No Sunday baseball and no alcohol allowed inside of the ballpark. Ticket prices were set high enough to keep rowdy fans away, and the rules aimed to make professional baseball respectable for the country's Protestant middle classes. But working people still wanted booze after a long work week. That takes us to the American Association, formed in 1882 as a counterpoint to the National League, one that would appeal to immigrants and working class people, many of whom could only go to a game on Sunday, and when they did, they wanted a drink. The American Association had everything the National League did not. Sunday baseball, half-price tickets, and beer. Christian Vondra, an immigrant from northern Germany, bought the St. Louis brown stockings for $1,800 in 1882 and joined the American Association. He knew next to nothing about baseball in 1882, but he had good business instincts. Next to Sportsman's Park in St. Louis, he built a racetrack, amusement park, and beer garden. He saw the profits to be earned from a captive market inside of closed grounds. Vondra's business model came naturally to men of German heritage who brought cultural ideas to their adopted homeland about relaxation and leisure. They grew up around beer gardens with long wooden benches where whole families went to hear music drink lager, and eat snacks such as pretzels, pickles, and bratwurst. In Milwaukee, Frederick Papps built an amusement park that had something for everyone, young and old. Papps also purchased an excursion steamer in Milwaukee on which you could drink a glass of beer and route to a nearby resort. German-style beer gardens were different from the ubiquitous saloon, where children and respectable women did not go. 
In contrast, the beer garden and ballpark were for everyone. And there's one more thing. German immigrants brought parboiled smoked sausages called Frankfurters to the United States. Because of their shape, vendors sold them as dachshund sausages and eventually hot dogs. By the late 1890s, hot dogs had entered the popular parlance and before long, vendors sold them in buns at baseball games. All of this is to say German Americans set the template at the turn of the 20th century. Ballparks were places of leisure where one could sit for two hours, sip lager beer, and relax outside with one's children, family, or friends. Hey, thanks for watching this one. If you liked the video, you might like others on this channel. And thanks for watching.